Welcome to the Seaports of the Future, a snapshot through the research and innovation in Europe. It's time to look forward and design the future of the seaports together with the industry players, port authorities, academia and research institutions, startups and policy makers. Let's welcome our host that due to an injury he couldn't be here with us, Michalis Kefalogiannis, the head of innovation of IT of OT Group IT Innovation Center. His role is to manage and enable OT Group to introduce innovative and game-changing technologies to customers and employees. Hello, Christo. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Perfect, hear thank you. Okay, I, I'm really happy to welcome you to this parallel session organized by OT on behalf of Dataports. We at OTE share the same ambition with all the Dataports partners to see the seaports of the future becoming smart and cognitive. The key to achieve this is the power of data and data-driven platforms. The acceleration of innovation speed, enabled by the technological advancement, the enormous potential of data collection and analytics, and the mobile accessibility to literally any place in the world holds possibilities that we as society and as enterprises have to develop. Digital transformation and artificial intelligence is the driving force for, sharing, for shaping the future of the seaports ecosystem. A successful enterprise approach on these two concepts is mandatory. It will lead to business transformation of key seaport operations, products, services and processes, as well as organizational structures and management concepts. OTE Group is not only a telecom operator, but also a significant ICT vendor. OTE is considered a strategic partner and service provider in many seaports and numerous shipping companies in Greece. OTE has embraced the IT ecosystem, acting as an integrator and enabler of port operations optimization, supply chain enhancement, and waste reduction. We believe that we can become key enablers to their digital and business transformation. Our ambition is to bring together all key stakeholders of the seaports of the future, to present their vision and strategy, to learn about the available solutions, and to listen about potential concerns and needs. These stakeholders include port authorities, policy makers, researchers, shipping industry representatives, and many more. The event you are attending will blend the business and market perspective with innovative solutions. Business and IT executives will be participating to provide you with a holistic view on the subject. We lay the field for all those individuals and organizations that imagine the future of the seaports to come through data exploitation and AI-based services to collaborate and, in the near future, to achieve the actual goal of smart, cognitive and green ports. I wish you an informative evening, and I hope you will enjoy this event. Thank you so much. Christo, you have the ball. Alice, thank you. Uh, let's, walk, let's watch uh, the first, the promotional uh, data ports uh, video.
this is data ports project, a data platform for the connection of uh, cognitive ports. Logistics and supply chain are the number one priority in the seaports, and there is a whole market around them. Alice, the Alliance for Logistics Innovation through Collaboration in Europe, develops a strategy for research, innovation, and market deployment of logistics and supply chain management innovation in Europe. Our speaker, Mr. Fernando Lieza, Secretary General from Alice ETP. Hello, Fernando. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having invited us uh, to be with you today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Giselis, for the nice introduction uh, to our association and myself. And I have uh, prepared a few slides, so then maybe you can share those slides. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this. Uh, I'm really honored to be with you today. I'm trying to uh, explain more what we do in, in Alice, uh, what's the vision we have in Alice as an organization, who is in Alice, uh, how we work, then uh, really to share with you our ambition on support transition to zero emission logistics in an affordable way. I think this uh, concept of smart cognitive and sustainable ports is really embraced by us and also in the recent uh, uh, Green Deal strategy and smart mobility strategy, uh, there is a clear target uh, for ports. They should become climate neutral by 2030, and this is a very big ch challenge. And there are many other projects like uh, data ports that are working on that, and, and then we as Alice try to, to connect to them. Then we will explain a little bit uh, more uh, the concept of uh, physical internet, really how to get these data spaces connected and working and not creating so much uh, silos because that scalability is what can make really innovation uh, be taken at a scale and creating the desired impact. And then I will share a little bit more on additional projects like uh, data ports that are working on this and other initiatives. I will give an overview of what we have gathered in Alice and the, and the logistics nodes ecosystem. And later I will uh, share with you a challenge that we are opening for uh, an award in Alice on uh, logistics uh, nodes. So going more in detail uh, here, you see a. a, a in this screen, one of the latest times we could meet uh, when we presented uh, the zero emission uh, roadmap to us, uh, zero emission logistics uh, uh, roadmap. This was at the end of 2019, just the day before the European Commission uh, was presenting the, the Green Deal. And really, uh, that time uh, we have been working already for a couple of years, and we could see in all those process in that process how the policy was matching our network intention and ambition. Alice was created not so long ago. In 2015, we were created as an association and more than 500 different uh, people are working uh, in Alice. These people are not in uh, Alice as an association, but coming from our, our members. And here you, you can have uh, an overview of the members. We can really say that all type of stakeholders in the freight transport and logistics are represented. You can see here many of the core uh, stakeholders addressed in the, in the conference today, uh, particularly ports and uh, terminals and uh, shipping lines but also other type stakeholders that are using these facilities, these networks, these ports, these hubs. And I, I want to stress here that you can also see many of the partners in data ports that are also part of Alice, like Transcendence or Entity Data or Valencia Port Foundation, uh, to name uh, a few. Then, Actually, in Alice, what we have is European leading companies and experts in implementing logistics and supply chain innovation. Our companies and our members are devoted to uh, transition to our zero emissions and make it in an affordable way and uh, find in Alice a good way to find people to collaborate with, to, to work with, and to really share uh, ideas and ambitions. Actually, Alice, what it does is to really create a framework for sharing and discussing these new concepts, trying to raise consensus on them, 
also based on this influence, uh, not only uh, the European Commission, for example, we, uh, we are always engaged in the description or definition of the uh, topics for calls for proposals in uh, programs like Horizon Europe, and for example, uh, topics like the one that uh, Data Post was bid in full and, and being funded. So then what, that's one of the elements what we, what we do, but also uh, trying to gather more consensus on industry and the need of working uh, together. Then also we, we gather knowledge and share knowledge in our network from the initiative of our members, but also from the various projects, more than 60 that are liaised with, uh, with Alice, uh, coming from members and non-members. And also we enable collaboration opportunities. So how we can really create uh, and we create uh, opportunities for our members really to to go to the next steps to really evolve in the in the roadmap implementation all this with the mission to accelerate the carbonization in an affordable way so uh, here I, I i was already preparing which are key elements that we need to to understand it's happening first of all we have the covid 19 that has created a lot of uh, push into the digitalization and capability, but we see also a lot of disruptions in the freight transport and logistics supply chains happen in the last couple of, of years. And this was really creating a lot of uh, movement in the container freight rates and also uh, unbalanced flows and, and really a lot of disruptions in many supply chains and increasing in costs. So then, this is one element. The other element is that when you see in the emission trading system that for some parts of the transport is not applying, but you see how the price of uh, CO2 emissions is growing, these elements uh, could tell us that uh, potentially in future transportation will be a little bit more expensive or could eventually be more expensive. When you change that uh, into the freight transport and logistics, a lot of innovation is required because uh, you need to rebalance what it was not worth before. Maybe it's worth doing that. And actually here, digitalization plays a key role in uh, particularly projects like Data Post in order to facilitate collaboration. So then you can really get a uh, easier, faster and cheaper collaboration, better use of the of the resources. And this is what we see uh, converging on the one side, the need for sustainability that will create a lot of tension and need for, for change and transition, and also the capability of uh, digitalization for doing that. Uh, actually here I didn't include, but it's very sad to, to see all what's going on in Ukraine and, and the war there that we could never expect in, in Europe again. And, and this, of course, uh, could have much more important uh, consequences, uh, much far beyond transport and logistics. But of course, transport and logistics will be deeply accepted. But uh, we see more and more these disruptions and stronger disruptions coming from very different fronts. And that's why we need also to develop the agile supply chains. On Ali's roadmap, uh, we had uh, uh, five uh, different um, uh, areas of intervention. What we see is there is a lot of focus on the technical innovation, zero emission energies, advanced vessels, and automation that are really key to reduce emissions, and that's very good. And we see a lot of push and, and support on this. While we don't see yet, is looking back into my er earlier slide, is that when we look into how current uh, transport modes, existing infrastructure assets are used, they could be much more efficiently used and sure. And then if we, uh, there is a need for more focus on this, uh, on this uh, uh, in order to make this transition affordable. And actually ports and hubs play a central role on this as we can only achieve a proper use of the resources through collaboration. And here is where the concept of the physical internet comes, because at the end, when you look into freight transport and logistics supply chain, even the biggest companies cannot make a proper use or can really rely on collaborations to make proper use of their resources and assets and infrastructure in the supply chain. This can only be achieved with open systems allowing easy access to resources and massive volume of flows, as it is the, the idea of these data posts and data uh, data spaces that can really enable uh, really uh, easy collaboration, easy engagement, understanding, and then uh, 
for that digital and physical, not only digital, but also physical interconnectivity is key. And uh, actually, when you look into this, you, we need to really develop uh, easy ways to access. And, and when I look into how uh, ports are developing their data, uh, data portals and all that, what I always uh, ask them is that, and what about the companies that are using multiple ports? Are they plug and play connecting to your platform or they need to integrate? And when the answer is uh, they need to integrate, they need to do something, then we still not be there on the physical internet. The physical internet should be able to plug and play and work with uh, everybody in the supply chain. So here there is a, a, a representation. You can see data posts, but there are many other related uh, uh, research and innovation projects that are liaised with Alice. And this is uh, the part we have in the uh, thematic group on corridors, hubs, and synchrome morality that we follow in, in Alice and then are developing either uh, similar concepts or uh, additional concepts in the in the same uh, idea and towards the implementation of our, our roadmap. And this uh, is the, my very last uh, slide. Uh, you, you can see here also, it was also included in the video from, uh, from data ports, the complexity of the ecosystem. And we, we did here two years ago, indeed, with uh, Miguel Job that will be speaking later today, this uh, uh, this uh, graph in which we see how this is advancing and we see that there is much more focus in the last couple of years uh, in a standardization in creating this type of uh, capability to really connect easily uh, digital and physical systems. We see the emergency the emergence of uh, uh, associations like the Digital Container Shipping Association, DIG 4.0, or the Open Logistics Foundation, that in different areas in the supply chain are really trying to address this concept, and we are really following on on them. But because we see this is really enabling these uh, smart, cognitive, and sustainable ports beyond what uh, research and innovation does, so we see a lot of things happening already in the in the market. And the very last slide, I, I we open a. Uh, uh, a challenge in Alice, it's uh, we call this uh, Logistics Innovation Award, and, and with this award, we want to recognize those companies and organizations that have built on research and innovation uh, results and then have transformed them either in uh, uh, products, services uh, that are offered into the market. So then we see really uh, research and innovation is directly creating impact after yeah, so then we can we want to recognize those uh, entrepreneurs that took over research and innovation results and, and went beyond the valley of death uh, after the projects and then uh, grant them with an award that we already did this for coordination and collaboration and run logistics and the next one is on logistics notes finishing uh, for submission on the 31st of March. So if you have participated in a research and innovation project or if you have uh, taken results of that research and innovation project and you can demonstrate you created impact in the in the market and sustainability then uh, this is the the place to to submit your application and that's all on my side i, I really uh, thank you for your invitation and i have seen the agenda and uh, that it, it's going to be very very nice and very good uh, uh, to follow all the developments uh, in this in this say thank you very much Thank you, Fernando. It was really a pleasure to have you here with us. And also on behalf of Dataports, I would like to thank you for letting uh, Dataports be a part of the knowledge uh, platform of uh, Alice. Now, digital transformation in seaports and maritime section in general requires innovative solutions and services. There is a need for innovation, researchers, startup companies to create such solutions. Let's hear about the vision and the activities of the Ministry of Developments and Investments, Research and Innovations. Let's welcome our speaker, Mr. Michalis Dritsas. Mr. Dritsas is the head of a cabinet of the Deputy Minister for Development and Investments, Research, Technology and Innovation, Dr. Christos Dimas. He is charter engineer and economist, and he has worked as an advisor to two ministers and two deputy ministers of development and investments in the area of research technology innovation and entrepreneurship. Mr. Mihalis Dritsas, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. 
Thank you very much to the organizers and the Cosmote for the kind invitation for the today's uh, conference and event. It's very important to discuss about issues about uh, like those that we have today. Uh, my presentation will have to do with innovation as a level of growth. And uh, I think it is quite self-evident why innovation is uh, important for the growth, because we know that through innovation, especially through disruptive innovations, uh, the society uh, enjoys better results in terms of uh, productivity, efficiency, and costs. And at the same time, the products and the services produced are of higher added value. and they are uh, more, let's say, marketable worldwide. But what a government can do to nurture innovation, this is the, the focus of my presentation. Uh, there are some structural measures for innovation promotion. The one has to do with the to provide incentives for increased spending in, uh, excuse me, uh, on research and uh, development, uh, to increase investment in education, in technology transfer offices, and, uh, and the formation of speed of companies, to try to enable entrepreneurs to start up their uh, businesses, their innovative businesses, more easily, and at the same time, to if they fail, to be able to exit the market the same quick way. But at the same time, the companies must be uh, have incentives in order to promote innovation. First of all, to conduct their own R&D, or internally, or in cooperation with uh, research organizations, to adopt open innovation, and why not? To, through mergers and acquisitions with startup companies, uh, which can provide these innovative solutions that they are looking for. Uh, the great challenge is to connect the three uh, RDI cycles that we see in this chart. We have the first stage, which has to do with uh, TRL 1 to 3, uh, where we are starting with research from, uh, for blue sky research, uh, curiosity driven research. The second phase has to do with the deployment of uh, the development and innovation. Uh, through a mix of a cooperation between research and innovation uh, organizations and industry, and, and the, uh, the TRLs three to six. And the last uh, TRLs, we have the cooperation between industry and research organizations, but the emphasis is on the industry itself. And uh, we also have some financial mechanisms and tools uh, through equity financing, which can support these disruptive technologies to be deployed in the market. And why is, again, one more time, why is innovation so important? If we check the components of the S&P 500 market value, we see that uh, throughout the years, the intangible assets account for at least 90% of the total value of a company. And what is this intangible assets about? We have, we're talking about patents, we're talking about patented uh, design, we're talking about uh, trade secrets, we're talking about uh, branding, advertising, human capital, and all that stuff. So having discussed about patents, let's see what happens in terms of global uh, competition. We see that the race is uh, quite uh, interesting, I would say. We see China has uh, outpassed the, the, let's say, the USA, Japan, Korea, and Germany in terms of patent applications, but also in terms of patent grants. Uh, and uh, if we check uh, the triadic patent families from uh, countries similar size of, uh, with Greece, we see that uh, Israel and Austria are quite high, uh, and uh, we are lagging behind, so we need to run faster as a country. And this is uh, the focus of uh, the state policy for the last two years, at least. And uh, if we check the R&D intensity, which is the gross domestic expenditure on R&D as a percentage of GDP, here we see that Israel has a 5% investment uh, of its GDP in R&D, South Korea followed by South Korea, and then we see Japan, US, China a little bit higher than Europe, and Canada. Uh, in this global competition, Greece ranks in the 16th position in terms of the European Union, but the last uh, results about 2020, the provisional results, say that uh, this, uh, uh, this expenditure will be at 1.5%, which will improve our position. We will be closer to the European Union's uh, average, which is 222. How this uh, increase is driven? It is in, this increase is driven especially from the business enterprise sector. And this is something that we have to focus on because always the government has been a big spender in uh, terms of uh, research and development. But uh, uh, in uh, Europe, uh, the intensity is uh, higher in terms of uh, business sector. And this is something that should approach. In terms of the European Innovation Scoreboard 2021, 
We see that Greece uh, belongs to the cohort of the moderate innovators. We rank in, in the 20th position. Uh, but the good news is that uh, Greece is among the top five performers in growth rate between 2014 and uh, 2021. Uh, and this is a good sign that we will improve on our position too. And we know exactly where we should focus on because if we would do a deep dive in how this index is uh, uh, comes out, we see that uh, we have to put an emphasis on PCT patents, design applications, government support to business R&D, venture capital expenditures, and these are measures that have already started to be deployed. The same result we have through the Global Innovation Index, where we see that in terms of inputs, Greece performs quite well, but in terms of innovation outputs, we need to do some more effort as well. So how the Greek research and innovation ecosystem is uh, uh, stands, and uh, what is the Greek state our research and innovation policy? We have two pillars. The first is the Ministry of Education, uh, with 25 higher education institutions. Uh, some of them are very well placed uh, in, global co uh, in global rankings. And the Ministry of Deployment and Investments, where I come from, we have the General Secretariat for Research and Innovation, and we have three pillars, the ELIDEC for basic research, the second is the 11 research centers for basic and mainly applied research, and three technology organizations for technology diffusion and uh, technology transfer. In, if we check that the Web of Science data regarding the scientific publications and the Greek citation index, we see an even uh, improving performance throughout the years. And not only that, but if you check the citation index, uh, we see that Greece performs even better compared to EU27 and OECD countries, which means that the, in, uh, the research performed in Greece is of a high level. Uh, the great challenge also is uh, how we perform in uh, Horizon 2020 programs. Uh, we see that we had an improvement uh, compared to FP7. We ranked in the eighth position in terms of participation, in 11th position in terms of uh, uh, budget allocation. And uh, if we check the state expenditure for research and development as a percentage of GDP, we see that the Greek government spends uh, at the same level with the uh, OECD countries close to 0 0.60, and now it is at uh, 0.69, which is even higher. So what are the r and uh, government targets? The first is to, to increase R&D expenses as percentage of GDP. The second is to build stronger uh, linkages of research with the uh, real economy. And the third uh, pillar has to do with uh, building stronger support to the startup and spin-off ecosystem. Uh, we have uh, the honor to have a national council for research and innovation comprised from uh, 15 esteemed uh, academics and in, in, uh, innovators as well, who are supported by 11 sectoral scientific councils, and they provide us with uh, guidance and support. We have already established our uh, smart specialization strategy for 2021-27. We have eight sectors where we will focus on. Three of them are very relevant with uh, the data ports and uh, having to do with digital technologies, with uh, sustainable uh, uh, and circular economy and uh, transport and logistics applied throughout the value chain of data ports and smart ports. The sources of funding uh, across uh, the last uh, 10 years, we see that Greek state has been the biggest source of R&D financing. But the good news is that uh, the business enterprising sector has been increasing its uh, share. Uh, it's at 37% uh, right now, but uh, we are approaching slowly but steadily Europe's 59%. And uh, how you give incentives to the businesses to uh, to come up with more research and innovation projects. Uh, you can apply tax incentives, and we have increased the super deduction incentive from 30% to 100%, and we believe that uh, this will be a key driver for improved R&D spending and better research results for the industry. In terms of building stronger linkages of research with the real economy, we have a call from uh, the structural funds, which is called Research Create Innovate. It has four calls within one call. The biggest uh, part of it is about the cooperation of businesses and research organizations accounting for 75% of the total budget. And uh, how you build stronger linkages of uh, research with the real community? In the last two years, we have established 12 competence centers, which are joint projects between uh, uh, companies uh, public-private companies. We have 32 innovation clusters, 
17 uh, newly established technology transfer offices and uh, the financing of uh, seven established uh, technology transfer offices. We have a brand new legislative framework for spin-off formation and development. We have a fund of funds providing equity funding and a new angel investors co-investment fund and uh, more than 100 uh, projects co-funded uh, for bilateral uh, relationships with Germany, Israel, China and other countries. Uh, last but not least, we also have the Elevate Greece initiative, which is an initiative within the GRSRI. We have already registered 700, uh, 570 startups in various sectors of the Greek economy. You can find all the information about these companies in that uh, uh, website, and also the whole Greek innovation ecosystem and the quadruple helix in one site. And uh, at the same time, we are uh, building innovation districts, one in Athens, it's called Kropi, uh, uh, another one in Thessaloniki, it's the Science and Tech uh, Park, Thessin Tech. And uh, also we have the expansion of the Patra Science Park and the new one which will be established in Ioannina. So throughout these efforts, we believe that through innovation, uh, we will in, uh, build an uh, inclusive network innovation ecosystem, and Greece will become the number one uh, research and innovation hub in uh, Southeastern Europe. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be glad to listen to the next uh, presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Michalis. Very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, it's good to know that uh, there is a support uh, for the startup community and innovation in general, and that uh, it's coming from the from the governmental um, uh, sector. Now it is time to go uh, a little bit deeper in the EU research initiatives related to seaports, shipping, and maritime transformation. Together, we can find out the latest news on all these research activities. Are there any available solutions ready to cover the industry needs? How AI-based solutions can be available through available data-driven platforms? For that reason, we invite several EU-funded projects to present their vision and results. And data ports, of course, hold a significant position in the preparation of the seaport transformation. Professor Carlos Palau, from the Universitat Polytechnic de Valencia will moderate uh, this panel. Professor Carlos Palau is a full-time professor in the ETSI Telecommunications at uh, Universit Universitat Politecnica de Valencia. He has more than 25 years of experience in research in area of security, privacy, content distribution, networking, interoperability, Internet of Things, smart cities, and wireless communications. Carlos, good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Christos, for the, for the presentation and thank you for, for the invitation to, to attend to the, to the event, to you and also to, the, to Cosmote uh, in the framework of, of, of the Dataports project. Uh, now we, we, we have a, a very, very good session that uh, uh, contains different uh, res research initiatives in different areas related with the maritime industry. It has been very, very good that before this presentation, you have allocated Ali's presentation, which provides the view of the all stakeholders related with the maritime industry and also the part of the, the, the political view of the, of the investments. So uh, today we, we, we are going to, to have in this, in this session, uh, first of all, uh, we are going to have Santiago Cáceres, uh, that it's uh, the, the, project, the project coordinator, the data ports, actually, the data ports project coordinator. Uh, later on, we will have uh, Theodora Calipolito uh, from, uh, the, the, the Celus Pro, from Celus. We also will have uh, Thierry Chevalier from Mobile Data Lab and uh, also Christina Lessi from Vital 5G. We will start with, with Santiago. Uh, Santiago is the data ports project coordinator, as I have already said. Uh, his, the, he, his main interest uh, right now are related with big data and artificial intelligence solutions, especially in the area of manufacturing, manufacturing and logistics and data ports. It's uh, one of the, of, the, of, the, of the key projects in this, in this area. Santiago is an electronic engineer and has more than 15 years of experience as project manager, working in, in, in areas of ICD and security. 
leading and participating highly innovative projects in the industry and right now uh, in the in, in IDI where he's uh, working right now. So Santiago, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Carlos, for the nice introduction. So I'm going to present the uh, data ports and its results. So if we can share the slides and prepare a small presentation. Yeah, here it is. So yeah, uh, I'm Santiago Cáceres, I'm the project coordinator of data ports. I work for ITI, which is a research center based in Spain, and uh, we are focused mainly on research uh, in the data life cycle. So we come from data acquisition and data exploitation, so covering all the technologies, uh, all, the, all, all the areas, from acquisition, processing, big data, IoT, artificial intelligence, etc. For, for this presentation, I'm going to give you a brief overview of what Dataport is about, what the objectives are, uh, I will go through the use cases, which I consider is uh, quite interesting to the audience. Uh, I, I will also put on the table some of, some of the challenges that uh, that the port has faced and is facing, and I believe are similar for other projects. And I will finish pointing out to our results and where you can find more information, just in case you are interested in talking. So, data ports stand for the data platform for the connection of cognitive ports, and it's an innovation action. So, if I have to define that report in a few lines of uh, what it is, its aim and what we are doing in the project, um, I will start telling you that we want to take advantage of the huge amount of data generated around the seaport, the European seaports. So, you know, ports are really complex ecosystems where many organizations, many entities are collaborating each day. They all, they all have their own. IT assets, IT infrastructure, they all are generating data. So the question is, are we taking maximum benefit out of all this huge amount of information? So that's, that's uh, one of the main uh, purposes of data port. How can we extract uh, all this uh, information coming from the data that's generated? So inside the project, we are developing an industrial data platform where we plan to combine all these data sources and our final aim is clear, it's to improve the existing uh, logistics and operation processes inside the ports, okay? Regardless of the entity where we are speaking, it can be a ship line, it can be uh, the port authority, it can be a terminal, whoever is inside the port uh, can take benefit of this industrial data platform where uh, he or she can combine the data uh, coming from its own data sources with others and can share and trade this data. Um, but it is not only to check what data we have available and that we want to share the situational awareness of what we can do to improve our existing processes. We also are building uh, what we call cognitive applications. These are artificial intelligence based applications. Thanks to these ones, we can predict or we can forecast what's happening in the port. Okay. So the ones who have to take decisions. Uh, will have an informed report of what can happen inside the in hours, days, weeks, or months, thanks to these cognitive applications. And of course, if we introduce uh, such a new disruptive tool inside the port, uh, we do some research around the business models and how each one in the whole chain can take benefit out of this industrial platform and out of this information. Okay, so that's, that's another point. So, <clears throat> going in some detail about the objectives of the support. So, um, we are going to deploy our solutions into relevant uh, seaports in Europe. I will go in a moment to this. I have a separated slide, so just uh, wait a little bit for this. We also uh, want to have semantic approach for data sharing. This thing that looks like, like a very research topic, it's uh, something more it's simpler. It's just, uh, we want to have a common data model that uh, could serve as a standard for all the European ports. So we are not uh, in the train the wheel or not from scratch. We 
they are, they are taking standards and uh, best practices in the seaports to make our proposal of a common data model that we can all use in the or can understand. Okay. We aim to create, we are creating these services. These services are able to predict and forecast what happened in, in the ports on the platform is uh, uh, intelligence based services. One of the parts of the data ports platform is a blockchain network. The blockchain network is something that offers many, many new possibilities. Uh, and, uh, and we are uh, using mainly, but not only, uh, the blockchain network to provide the data governance framework. So, if we have data inside the platform, uh, who's the owner, who's the provider, who can consume this data, uh, for what, how long, it can, uh, um, and, uh, and, and other questions. So we are, uh, thanks to smart contracts, we are, and we are uh, giving these functionalities to the, to the platform. We are also, uh, we have also developed a complete IT architecture uh, as a reference one, and, uh, and uh, we have delivered this, and uh, you will have it later on. And of course, we want to create final impact uh, on the by our technologies and the things that we are proposing. And uh, you previously, we are looking for new business frameworks, for new ways of collaboration, and and how everybody inside the world can take the benefit out, out of it. Okay. So uh, going into some details of the use cases and the board that are involved in the project, so you can have an overview or a quick view on the things that we are developing and how this is helping to the, to the people in the port. The first uh, use case is in Valencia port, in the east coast of Spain. Um, and, uh, and here we are now deploying the platform. So the project started two years ago. It's finishing by the end of this year. And we are now in the phase of deploying everything and to have complete demonstrators uh, inside the port that would be available uh, with this tool. Okay. Uh, the, the Valencia port use cases uh, are several. The tracking of transport operations that we are doing uh, is to aggregate data from different uh, entities inside the port dealing with uh, logistic trucks or operations. And we are transmitting events that are uh, deployed by the end users that are interesting to them. So it can be security events, it can be events uh, about estimated type of arrivals of containers. There are many. So we aggregate all this data from different uh, stakeholders and we serve it to the to the to the port people in, in, a, in a good way. Then we have the Port Authority Data Training and Analytics Services. So we are integrating data port platform inside the port community system of Valencia Port. And thanks to Data Port platform, we are enhancing and improving the capabilities of the port community system, giving them, giving them for example, this uh, a artificial intelligence uh, predictions that they can consume directly in their, in their business. And then there are a couple of uh, use cases which are dealing mainly with the with the functionalities of the blockchain, where we, where we are going to share some information between many stakeholders. And sometimes, when uh, there are discrepancies in the current systems of what's happening, as in the case of the verified gross mass of a container, so the the container is is, is uh, it's uh, it's very is is PGM is calculated in several steps. There can be discrepancies. So, for example, in, in this case, what we are doing is to rely on the, on the data that is on chain in the blockchain network. You have to have a consensus on, on, on the value and on, on the, so there are some taxes and some things that depends on that and something this is sometimes this is something to be subject to discussion. So we avoid this thanks to the blockchain network. Okay. The second uh, use case scenario is the interoperability port in Greece. So then what we are doing is, again, to combine all the data sources that we have inside the port together with some external data sources that can come, for example, from weather stations or from, from, uh, from uh, systems of uh, the city close to the port. And uh, we are providing there, next to the data platform and dashboard to the operators, just to have a quick view, a, a, a clear view of what's going on inside the port and like, so they can take the right decisions. Okay. We also have other views of, of the platform and other uses, like 
uh, we are using it to uh, give permit ID IDs for the for the truck containers for the containers for the trucks companies, so they can uh, they can manage everything uh, in inside the port thanks to the data platform. And apart from that, we are also calculating the statistics prediction. We are giving some information also to to cruise passengers, uh, professionals working in the in the port, visitors, etc. So there are a, a wide range of, of services that we are developing inside the salon. And last but not least, we have what we call a global scenario. This is a scenario where we are aiming to show uh, how easy it is to escalate the data platform and it's uh, and to show us that it's highly interoperable with other systems. And for doing that, we are we have a couple of technologies from data post partner that are in use in the ports and, and, uh, and feed the data post platform. One is the small container, so we are putting some advanced sensors in the containers, attached to the containers, and they are giving us not only the, the location of the container, but also uh, they can uh, monitor things like uh, unauthorized door openings or shocks to the container. So thanks to that, we can have a, a pool with the containers and that fits the platform and, and goes to the right stakeholders. And the second uh, global scenario is our core management system, which is a... Uh, Enhancing one commercial solution, one from our product, the Posidonia uh, software suite tool. And this is a, 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 a software that is running currently in many ports in, in Europe, especially in Spain. Uh, and uh, what we are doing is uh, extending it thanks to the capabilities. So we show that we are already integrated. So we show how easy it is to integrate this existing commercial system. Okay, so I just want to go through the, some of the data challenges that we have uh, found out in the, the data port. If this is quite common from all research uh, projects that are working in the same area, so I think it's interesting to discuss with you some uh, yeah, food for thought. The first is the data heterogeneity. So one of the things that you may find in the ports is that the information systems and data infrastructure are completely different uh, in terms of quality and quantity, depending on, on where you are in the world. So that's something that when you design your solution, uh, you have to take into account as a significant effort to make it homogeneous and to handle it in the proper way. The second thing is the trust and security, which is something that uh, we consider that is a must. It's something that you have to uh, put at the front since the very beginning. No one is going to use any data-driven tool or any data-driven story if they don't have the trust to do it and the security mechanisms in place and, and uh, to go ahead. Okay. So that's something that uh, sexual information flow between all the different all the stakeholders has to be very clear and they have to trust your solution. It's something that, it, that it's a challenge not only technical but also operational. Okay. Then blockchain is a technology that uh, uh, it's uh, already used in some ports. There are some already there are some existing solutions like trailers that make it of blockchain technology. Um, yeah, we are also doing our research on this area, so, so we believe there's room for research. We are uh, developing a world that governance framework based on blockchain, and, uh, and we publish uh, data in chain only peer-to-peer, -peer, and we believe uh, this is something that they still have uh, has many, many room for, for research in the future project and also in the near future. Okay. And last but not least, our reality, the predictive analytics that we are developing in the project, uh, it, has to, it has to be very clear that you need very good quality data and in quantity of data. So as, as we say in the data science world, you put garbage in, you will only get garbage. So it has to be clear that the more data you need, the more quality it has, the more you get the cognitive services and the prediction. And just to finish my presentation, uh, the last couple of slides, uh, as I said, we are, we, are, we are running two years already. We have uh, 
many, many results are already published. You have in the slide the links to information. So if you have curiosity or you are interested in some of the results and other, I just highlighted some of the results. There are many others, but I just want to put the four at the front. Uh, we have a complete specification of the industrial data platform where we gather all the requirements coming from, the, from all the entities in the port and all the technological requirements. So this is available in our public documentation. We have specified this, the, 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 the use cases I, I just presented. We have uh, our version of the data post architecture already available. So if you are an IT expert and want to check uh, how are we handling all these issues in terms of technology, IT, etc. That's, that's probably your document. And we have the first version of the platform components already delivered. And by, by June this year, we will have the second and third version of the components that will go directly into the ports for demonstrations. Okay. Apart and only from developers, we have this uh, website, which uh, has some leaf technical documentation about our components. Okay. And that's it from my side. So if, uh, if you have any doubt or you want to there are my, my coordinates, and uh, um, I will be happy to discuss later if there are any questions. I'm looking forward to see the rest of the presentations in, in the session and in the whole show, which are really interesting. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, thank you, Santiago, for the for the presentation. Uh, at the end of the of the of the panel, at the, uh, we will have a, a turn of questions. Uh, that will be after the, the presentation of everybody. Now, uh, I want to, to give the floor to, to, to Mrs. Theodora Calipolito, that works as delivery manager in Celius since 2020. Her interests include the exploitation of digital technologies for the development of sustainable products and services uh, that would thrill their users and contribute to the transition for the linear to the circular economy. Uh, Mrs. Theodora, the floor is yours. Yes. Ah, ah, okay. yes. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you very much for the, for having me here. Uh, I'm uh, representing uh, Zilus, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, two uh, research and innovation programs uh, funded by Horizon 2020, and more specifically about the challenges that uh, we are trying to tackle in the context of uh, extreme scale multimodal data analytics and visualizations for cybersecurity. Uh, assessments. So a uh, bit of the, about the agenda, so I will walk you through uh, who we are uh, as Zilus, uh, give you some background context on uh, Sairin and Marvel, and talk to you also about our future plans. So Zilus, who we are? Uh, we are um, an, uh, an ICT uh, SME based in Athens. We started our journey in 2019. In 2020, we uh, got our first funding from Horizon uh, 2020 in, uh, in Europe. And uh, in 2021, we went commercially. Uh, we commercially launched uh, our first uh, uh, cyber security and uh, digital forensic uh, solutions. And this year, we are also launching our sustainability consulting services and uh, digital tools, and which are more focused on the circular economy. Um, our uh, strategic compass uh, has always research uh, in mind, of course, user-tested solutions and uh, business results. Today we are going to focus on, uh, on the research part and more particularly on uh, Sairin and Marvel, uh, two projects that, uh, as I mentioned before, they are funded by Horizon 2020. In Sairin, we collaborate with uh, 13 more partners from nine countries uh, and we are working on uh, creating building blocks for resilience in evolving ICT systems. And in Marvel, we're working with uh, 17 more uh, uh, partners from uh, 10 European countries, and we are working on big data technologies and extreme scale analytics. Now, uh, going more into detail uh, regarding Sairin, uh, Sairin is trying to, uh, is focusing on certifying the security and resilience of uh, supply chain services. And uh, with that, uh, we are trying to achieve the much needed trust uh, among uh, partners and of course the customers regarding cybersecurity of uh, shared assets. Uh, in particular, we are focusing on, on uh, three uh, levels. The first one is the, the business level and has to do with uh, the supply chain service providers. Uh, yes. <laughs> the supply chain service providers uh, business processes. The second one is the technical level and has to do with the supply chain service providers um, 
infrastructure. And the last uh, is the sectoral level and has to do with all the assets that the partner that collaborates with the supply chain service provider um, uh, serves, uh, basically, and how this in, uh, influence the, the vulnerability of the overall uh, service and uh, its attack potential. Um, the whole point is that we bring all these uh, assets, infrastructures, and processes uh, into the virtual world and with the use of a structured conformity assessment methodology, um, basically we are uh, making sure that the target assurance level uh, that uh, all these partners have, uh, have agreed to uh, have for their supply chain is actually the one that they do have. Zillow solution um, uh, spreads around the first three steps of uh, this methodology. Uh, here is an overview of the architecture uh, within Sirene, but due to uh, yeah, time constraints, I, I will not delve into it. I'm also not uh, uh, that uh, I don't have the specific background. However, I would like, uh, given the context that I shared with you, uh, to start like a hot question that is being discussed uh, at the moment, uh, which is where should the, this whole system of Sirene uh, deployed? The one option is in-house, uh, in the premises of the supply chain service uh, provider that uh, has and is accountable for the whole uh, service, of course, which gives um, much better control over the whole uh, conformity assessment and also of the data that, uh, that enter the system. And the other option is a cloud develop, uh, deployment that allows uh, remote access, including the one of the partners, of course, uh, larger scalability, simpler networking, etc. Um, so yeah, for the ones that are uh, watching us online, please drop in the chat uh, your idea. And uh, the ones that are here physically, like we can uh, we can talk about this uh, later. Um, something that can help you also decide on this and understand a little bit better our project is uh, our pilots. The first one uh, here as well is uh, Valencia port, uh, port that was mentioned earlier. Uh, Valencia is very interested in, uh, in this system because um, they are focusing on uh, one service that is extremely complex with a lot of uh, partners and a lot of assets, uh, and it's the vehicle transportation um, service. Uh, and in particular in two of its phases, so the, the, the pre-upload um, and the upload and the delivery of uh, vehicles. So ideally, if they could monitor uh, how this uh, whole process uh, uh, performs and the assets involved in order to avoid uh, any potential of, uh, of attack, that would be like a huge uh, asset for them. The second one is uh, Stellantis, and in particular the CRF, the Fiat Research Center, which can serve both as a partner meaning taking part in the, the third level that we mentioned at the beginning, the sectoral one, um, and check how the assets they share, the connected assets they share with the port, uh, for example, when they transport a vehicle from Italy to Spain, um, is affecting the overall uh, security, cybersecurity of the, of the service, but also as a, a provider themselves, if we think uh, their inbound logistics uh, process where they collaborate with a lot of uh, partners in order to source uh, products, components, and so on and so forth. Uh, here you see um, our first level of contribution as Zulus, uh, and this is the, um, the support of the um, security, agreement, uh, security declaration uh, agreement uh, process. And uh, basically what is happening there is uh, we have a dynamic process that um, makes sure that the partners agree on specific levels uh, of uh, security and um, provide the, necessarily, the necessary uh, data and uh, proofs of uh, what they do from their side in order to, to ensure this, uh, this level. And this process uh, validates uh, that uh, this is indeed what they are uh, promising. And later on, when the conformity assessment actually is performed, is updating these agreements in order to keep them um, uh, relevant. Moving on to uh, Marvel, uh, this is a completely different uh, context and, and, and product and pr um, project. It's about uh, multi-model extreme scale uh, data analytics for, uh, for smart cities. And uh, practically it capitalizes on all the multi-model, uh, especially audiovisual data streams of a smart city and tries to uh, process them basically in order to give the decision makers uh, the, um, the data needed to improve the quality of life uh, of the citizens. It is based, uh, 
it, it, is, uh, it is consisting of uh, four main pillars. Uh, the first one is um, uh, real heterogeneous distributed big data in smart cities uh, environments. Uh, basically, this is about the collection of data, and it includes cameras, microphones, uh, drones, and whatever you can imagine. The second pillar, um, and, and their processing, of course. The second pillar uh, is uh, AI uh, edge to fog to cloud uh, distributed ubiquitous uh, computing architecture. And this basically uh, supports uh, the sanitization of the, of, of the capturing of data and later on their preparation for, for uh, the um, for the AI models to, to start uh, being uh, applied. Uh, the third pillar is uh, AI-based intelligence for the multimodal perception and situational awareness. Uh, this is quite self-explanatory, I guess, but the, the whole point here is to minimize uh, human intervention. And the last one is a quantitative assessment of um, edge to fog to cloud uh, and uh, multimodal uh, AI uh, uh, tools and methods. Uh, based on um, benchmarking methods uh, that are uh, considering societal, academic, and uh, industry-validated uh, values. Uh, so we see where the solution and the framework as a whole stands. Um, this here is, again, the Marvel architecture. As you can see, it's, uh, it's a rather complex one. So again, I'm not going to delve into it. I see also I don't have that much time left. So basically what I can tell you uh, very quickly is that uh, the Marvel framework consists of uh, 29 uh, technological components. They are grouped in uh, seven uh, subsystems that make sure that the data, uh, if we go like the way you see it, the data is collected, is sanitized, is uh, um, passed uh, to the data management system that decides uh, where to distribute them better uh, afterwards. AI models are making sure the right insights are being uh, uh, taken, and uh, the edge to fog to uh, cloud uh, processing and deployment sus subsystem is making sure that these are deployed in the best, uh, in, in the optimal way possible. Of course, everything is running on uh, on the infrastructure that uh, supports all these three uh, tiers. And last but not least, uh, we have the system outputs, where you find again our solution as Zillus. Oh, sorry. Uh, where uh, basically we are focusing on the visualizations and the decision-making toolkit for uh, the users. And there is one more uh, system, which is the data, um, the data corpus, which is more focused on uh, data analysts and the scientific and uh, research community in order to be able later on to build on the uh, data that uh, come out of Marvel, as well as the, the, um, the methodologies and the models, uh, the AI models. Uh, Marvel is being implemented in uh, two smart cities and uh, in one university campus as a, as a control uh, environment that uh, the results can also be supported, uh, can also support the, the other two environments. And our first um, MVP basically was uh, released two months ago, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, it was focused on the, the second use case that you see here uh, in uh, the Malta and uh, road traffic uh, management. And it had to do with how uh, basically insights from Marvel uh, can help traffic managers um, improve uh, traffic rules basically, but also plan better for the, um, for the urban uh, interventions and traffic interventions. Here you can see some screenshots from the decision-making toolkit, but I guess it's, uh, it would be much more uh, smooth for you if, uh, if you, yeah. Uh, visit our website uh, or uh, what's in uh, the YouTube channel actually the, the, the presentation and then you can get a, a bit of a better um, idea what this is about. Uh, now, future plans. So as you see, uh, Zillus is in the intersection of uh, both these uh, systems that are being developed in these projects uh, with their uh, end users. And the idea that we want to explore is uh, what would happen if, for example, we apply the edge to fog to cloud continuum to the siren system in order to have real-time continuous um, uh, security uh, as a conformity assessments. So we can watch, especially in very complex uh, environments and services like the ones in uh, big ports, we can watch in real time what is happening with all the assets that are being moved. Uh, we are very interested in your input. And uh, of course, if you want to, to talk to us, uh, please reach out. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very, very much for your time. And that would be it from my side. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dora, for the, for the presentation. And now it's the turn for uh, Mr. Thierry Chevalier. He's the coordinator of the Mobidata Lab project funded by the European Union uh, in order to facilitate mobility data sharing across uh, actors. Thierry Chevalier is a software project leader and specialist in location-based services and web mobile geo-application. He current, currently works for AKKA, a French-based te technological company, and is also involved in the ecosystems of digital startups in Toulouse, south of, south of France. So, uh, Thierry, the floor is yours. I think you are doing... No, thank you for the introduction. I hope you can hear me well. Okay, I guess it's the case. Um, thank you for the for the slides. So, well, yes, my name is uh, Thierry Chevalier. So, I work for Aka Technologies uh, in France, and I'm coordinator of the Mobi Data Lab project, which is funded by the um, European Union, along with a consortium of ten partners. Um, so, um, what is Mobi Data Lab? As its name suggests, uh, it is a lab and a lab for what? For actually prototyping future mobility data sharing solutions. Uh, so uh, we deal with uh, mobility data and transport data at large and with um, a data sharing um, uh, ecosystem. So uh, why sharing mobility data? Actually, the question is uh, uh, the basis for the project. Um, it comes from the observation that uh, new mobility services appear in both uh, the public and the private sector, and that more and more data are produced in various forms. So everyone agrees that data sharing can lead to more efficient processes and new products in the transport systems. However, there is still a lot of reluctance to share data between the transport stakeholders. So this is in order to remove these barriers and, and work on improving the culture of sharing data. But Mobi Data Lab proposed this uh, solution, which is based on, on, uh, on four pillars. Uh, the first one is a, an open knowledge base, let's say a Wikipedia of mobility data. Uh, for what reason? Because um, sharing knowledge is as important as uh, sharing data, actually, for the transport stakeholders. The second pillar is a prototype, uh, what we call a transport cloud, which is a, a portal of mobility data available in selected areas, uh, let's say pilot sites or um, let's say innovation sites in selected areas in Europe. Uh, the third pillar is a, it's to use this uh, transport cloud in a innovation context and organizing innovation sessions that we call living and virtual labs, uh, and bringing together uh, municipalities, uh, transport, uh, data providers, and data consumers on the other side. And the fourth uh, pillar is an evaluation framework just to assess the impact of uh, what we have performed in the course of the project. So uh, if we go a bit more into the details of uh, this uh, four pillars uh, and starting with the uh, open knowledge base actually we have a consortium of 10 partners and which represent uh, complementary expertise so we have the opportunity to uh, bring uh, forth different perspectives uh, regarding mobility data sharing legal and governance data privacy uh, standards uh, technical uh, solutions existing in the cloud and the use cases uh, second, the proof of value is a, a prototype of uh, a prototype platform for searching multimodal mobility data. Sorry, uh, in a given context. So this is actually a federation of cloud services for finding, accessing, interoperating, and uh, reusing data. So for finding uh, mobility data, we have uh, reference data catalogs. For accessing data, we propose uh, with our partners uh, several data, data access services. Uh, also, we have uh, data privacy experts because uh, security and trust is really a key issue when it comes to sharing data. 
And last but not least, for our hackathon participants, we need to, uh, to give them the opportunity and the possibility to enrich the data. The data. So these are uh, that what we call data processors for enriching the data geographically, semantically, and converting data. Uh, well, the key uh, feature of the Mobi Data Lab project, and uh, let's say uh, what makes it original, is that we propose to put this into practice and to organize uh, innovation sessions, bringing together uh, data providers on the one hand and data users on the other. And for this, we have two partners of the consortium, which are networks of members, for instance, the police networks of municipalities and um, public transport authorities in Europe, and the FCS uh, network of uh, startup owners, startup founders, on the other hand. And, and we want to bring them together uh, in the context of hackathons and datathons in order to uh, find uh, solutions to concrete mobility challenges uh, using open data as a tool. So for this, we have the support of several municipalities and regions in Europe, for instance, the uh, Mobility Agency of Rome, Eindhoven, Milan, Malaga, Hamburg, etc. Um, the fourth pillar is about assessing the impact. So here we, we uh, envision the uh, market approach, market analysis approach, uh, analyzing the business possible business models and revenue models for a um, mobility data spaces and assessing uh, the impact of data sharing in various social and economical point of view. So uh, we work on uh, several use cases, uh, mainly for transport operations. Uh, we work on uh, optimization of transport flows, estimated time of arrivals. We also work on the uh, evaluation of emissions, um, also on analytics and learning. Here we, we take a wider approach uh, for analyze, analyzing transport data uh, with our uh, innovators. Uh, we also work on journey planning services and mobility as a service. And besides that, we also uh, work on use cases for research. So uh, working for improving the uh, inclusiveness of transport and the sustain sustainability. Also, we work um, specifically on linked open data because the semantic approach is uh, something that will help us to go a bit wider from the context of uh, urban uh, transport to go to wider um, landscape of transport data, thanks to the semantic web. So the results and the achievements that we, uh, um, that we can present so far are available on the website, mobidatalab.eu. Uh, just to let you know that the project started last year and it will uh, last until uh, beginning of 2024. Um, so here it is. Thank you very much for listening. And on behalf of uh, Mobi Data Lab, uh, I, uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Terry, for the for the for the presentation. Now uh, the the we have uh, Christina Lessi that received the diploma in electrical and computer engineering in uh, 2011, 2011 from Democritus University of Trust and a master in microelectronics from the National and Kabodistian University of Athens. She has been working in OTE Group since uh, 2013. Currently, she's a member of, of Core Network Test Testing Lab of OTE, and she participates in European research projects and national funded projects. So, uh, Christina, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Christina Lessi. I'm a technical manager in OTE for research projects. And I will present you the solutions that the Vital 5G project uh, proposes for a smart port. Uh, so in this presentation, uh, the overview of Vital 5G project will be presented. Then the basic 5G technology characteristics will also be presented and the innovations that uh, this technology brings to vertical sectors. And then uh, the two of the three use cases of Vital 5G project will be presented, the seaport use case and the river port use case, and the uh, added value that uh, 5G technology brings to these use cases. 
So, uh, vertical innovations in transport and logistics over 5G experimentation facilities, or Vital 5G for short, is a research project funded uh, through ICT41 call. 16 partners uh, participate, uh, participate on this project. You can see here also the, the link for the official website of the project, where you can find more detailed information, the outputs, news and events, and of course, the, all the public deliverables. Vital 5G vision is to deploy a flexible platform to serve specific needs of transport and logistics sectors. To do that, NetApps will be deployed, managed, and validated through three use cases that will be demonstrated. In this figure, on the top, you can see the platform where the NetApps will be integrated. And then, on the bottom of this figure, are the three, uh, the three experimentation facilities where demonstrations will take place. Two of uh, the three use cases uh, are uh, focusing on uh, ports, one on sea port and one on river port, while the third one focuses on uh, warehouse uh, solutions. In this project, uh, we will also invite third-party experimenters in order to test their own solutions by using our facilities and uh, the platform and the, the NetApps that uh, we will create, but we will also let them create their own NetApps and use them in our platform. So I could say that uh, Vital 5G vision is to deploy an environment which will drive the European integration of 5G services into the transport and logistic vertical. Focusing a bit on 5G technology and what it brings to our solution, we could say that 5G comes not only to support the production line by increasing throughput or uh, by um, providing uh, an extra availability and reliability of the interconnection, but also plays an important role in order to add new services in the production line. And when I say new services, I mean security uh, or safety of the people who are working or increase the quality of the products. In order to achieve all these new services, apart from the production, the productivity increase, of course, there are several components that will be used. These components have uh, unique requirements. So the 5G technology brings all these requirements together. Three generic type of services are created in order to achieve this. As you can see here, these three generic services are the enhanced mobile broadband, which focuses on providing higher bandwidth, ultra-reliable and low-latency communications, which brings uh, low latency in communications, which is very important in uh, 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 real-time uh, um, services, and uh, massive machine-type communications, which focuses on support a large amount of devices. So let's move on now to the use cases. The first one is the support use case. First of all, let me tell you that uh, the Vital 5G port use cases target on uh, vessel-based transport and logistics. So for the seaport use case, our target is to uh, replace the manual of operation of a port with an automated uh, operation of the port. So to do that, we will install several sensors and cameras on the port and on ships and on inland vessels. And we are planning to create a digital twin of the port and the vessels and the whole environment. By doing this, we will be able to, uh, first of all, uh, control 
the, the whole environment, knowing where ships are, how they are moving, if there are obstacles. And uh, by that, we will be able to uh, create new routes according to the environment or even uh, use uh, navigation speed uh, optimization in order to increase uh, the dwell time. And also uh, give the ability for uh, one person to control the routes of several vessels. Our target with this use case is to improve infrastructure safety. Since we are planning to uh, create automated routes, so to avoid accidents on ports, to reduce dwell time in port, because unfortunately uh, inland vessels requires a, a sort of time in order to load and unload, and we are planning to uh, reduce this time. And uh, finally, to decrease the manual planning for operations in inland navigation. To do that, we are planning to install uh, cameras, high resolution cameras and uh, sensors. So a, lot, a large amount of data should be transferred through network. And in, and in order to avoid uh, latencies uh, from uh, video compression, high throughput is required for this kind of use cases. Additionally, real-time services that are described in this use case, of course, requires low latency. And high reliability also ensures that we will achieve this low latency. If you remember, I mentioned that three types of services are designed in 5G technology. And as you can see here, in this use case, all three of these are required. The second use case is the river port use case. Unlike the first one, in this use case, uh, we won't have automated operations. We will have an amount of uh, sensors and video cameras in order to collect inputs from the environment letting operators to create routes, change, uh, change the routes and the uh, navigation and create uh, high resolution uh, maps for uh, ship navigations. So our target in this use case is to reduce the number of dangerous navigation events since the sensor will collect uh, data from the environment. For example, in a river, maybe there are places where there are uh, sand, uh, sandbanks, which are dangerous for ships, uh, or uh, there are shallow waters in some places. So several sensors would detect this danger uh, environment uh, situations, and then the operator or the navigator will be able to reroute uh, the uh, ship and uh, taking into account other ships that are nearby, preventing from uh, dangerous situations. And of course, reduce logistic costs and uh, create more accurate electronic navigation map. Again, in this use case, low latency is very important since data should be collected at the time that an event is detected in order to be able to design the new routes. High bandwidth also is very important because there are a large amount of sensors, uh, high definition cameras, so uh, high bandwidth is definitely required in this use case. And of course, high reliability that ensures that uh, the, uh, the low latency will be eventually achieved. Uh, to sum up, uh, as I presented in these two use cases, uh, a large amount of data will be transferred in order to ensure that uh, ports are safer for people who are working, for, for uh, uh, the equipment that is used for ships, and uh, in order to achieve automation in operations and uh, reduce logistic cost. So in order to achieve all this, uh, the 5G technology 
can offer several benefits by providing high throughput, low latency and high reliability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cristina, for the, for the presentation. Now is the turn for Mr. Spiros Muzakitis. He's a senior research analyst in the Decision Support System Lab on the National Technical University of Athens. Uh, his current research is focused on decision support system based on machine learning and deep learning, big and linked data analytics. And he has worked more than 10 years uh, of industry experience in software engineering for banking, e-commerce, and energy suppliers. He has worked as project manager for 16 years in more than 20 projects, and he's current, currently the technical coordinator of BSLAI project. Okay, so please, Spiros, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me. To I would like to thank Dataports and Cosmote to this very interesting event. And I already see a lot of collaboration points with the previous projects. Um, and as you will see, we have a lot of common uh, things that we can discuss and collaborate after this meeting. So uh, our project is a European funded project uh, that was funded under Big Data Technologies and Extreme Scalar Analytics. We started last year and we have three years of duration. Um, we have a strong consortium and diverse. We are uh, 13 partners from uh, six countries. And six pilot partners are pioneers in the maritime technology, like uh, Marine Traffic, uh, Masterly, Konsberg, VTT, and Napa. And we have seven technical partners with expertise in data engineering and analytics, high performance computing, and AI acceleration hardware, and artificial intelligence. So um, there is a good collaboration and balance between the technical partners and the domain experts, which is always a key ingredient for artificial intelligence projects. So the beginning of 2022 finds uh, uh, artificial intelligence, high performance computing, and uh, big data in the forefront of maritime uh, digital transformation, as well as in any other domain, actually. And uh, the maritime industry needs to embrace it in order to address the increasing uh, needs in terms of safety, security, energy efficiency, and climate change. So to get a glimpse of these uh, needs, there's still a large number of incidents that are happening and accidents happening in the sea that it is attributed to the human error. We all remember the accident uh, last uh, year with the Ever Given and the effect it had in the global economy as well as many other accidents more recently. And uh, still, shipping is responsible for a considerable amount of uh, global greenhouse gas emissions that are expected to increase the next years. So the key to address these challenges lies with the uh, research and development of novel technologies, such as distributed and extreme scale data processing within memory databases, uh, streaming SQL and parallel processing, especially when it comes to the ingestion the, the semantic enrichment and the serving of uh, uh, the, the data, the machine learning and deep learning, the advances in the machine learning and deep learning uh, methods that are able to solve uh, non-linear problems more efficiently than the traditional methods, such as uh, convolution neural networks, recurrent neural networks, and uh, as well as we're going to see in the future more application for the reinforcement learning. That's, it's going to bring a lot of impact in the industry. And at the same time, we have also advancements in high performance computing uh, with neuromorphic processors that are able to train uh, those AI models much more efficiently. Uh, for problems that you needed months to, to train some models, now you may need some minutes. So all these technologies can take an advantage the large amount of data that is being generated within the shipping industry to have a diverse range of uh, maritime applications, such as uh, vessel traffic monitoring and management, the, the ship uh, design and operation, autonomous shipping, fleet intelligence, route optimization, fuel consumption, and predictive maintenance. Next slide. Does it work? Okay, 
So another technology that is gaining a lot of ground and we already heard from the previous project is the concept of a digital twin. So a digital twin is a digital representation of a physical entity such as a vessel or a port. And the physical entity generates, uh, generates real-time data and sensor that feeds the digital model. So with the digital models, you can optimize time and money through monitoring, simulation, and analysis of the assets and workflows within the digital model. So uh, another very important uh, application of the digital twins is that they are able to generate uh, data in, that can be used for training the AI models, especially in cases where obtaining ground truth observations is very hard or costly uh, or even rare. So what is the problem of adopting all these technologies? from the marine time industry. First of all is the limited uh, effort, the high cost and the limited expertise. And another problem is that most of the companies don't usually say is that AI is not always an off-the-shelf uh, product that you can plug in and it will work. Uh, you need to understand the, the bias in your project. You need to, something that works re real well in one scenario for a specific problem may not work in another scenario with different kind of context. Some of the technical challenges is to integrate the existing physics-based uh, simulations with data-driven uh, simulations for the next generation of digital twins, the data processing of the data that we mentioned before, being able to create AI models that don't have bias and they are accurate and they can, they, they can work in different scenarios, as well as the uh, unexploited opportunities for enhancing uh, HPC architectures with AI acceleration. That would be key for the maritime industry because there are a lot of cases where it's the extreme scale issue. So this is where our project comes in to, prov to provide a novel a framework of combining HPC, AI, and big data technologies in order to fuel the next generation uh, applica marine time applications and digital twins. So we have uh, four pilot use cases. The first uh, has to do with ship modeling for global vessel traffic monitoring and management that's been led by marine traffic. Currently, marine traffic monitors the entire life cycle of a vessel. So from historical vessel positions, the time of departure from a port. Uh, for the present, the load condition vessel draft, the average speed of the voyage, and many other aspects from the present, as well as the future. What is the estimated time of our arrival? So within the context of vessel AI, the, the key goal here is to uh, have accurate route forecasting at a global scale and involving a lot of ships as well as collision detection. So to develop more accurate, timely and scalable traffic prediction for an extended forecasting horizon and to shift from the simple uh, kinematic models that are currently being used and experiment with more data driven uh, machine learning and deep learning uh, models that include features from both static data as well as dynamic data. So uh, these can be, these AI models to be uh, created and ex uh, we will experiment with can fuel the existing products of the marine traffic, including the vessel and fleet tracking and management, the port congestion, as well as visibility and support on the cargo delivery. Uh, the second use case is also to have real-time mobile and uh, platform notification from the end users coming from these models, for instance, for the root prediction. The second uh, use case is a very interesting one, is how we can utilize AI, big data, uh, and the HPC for the energy system design and optimization. So to automatically explore the design space in order to find the optimal design concepts of the ship energy systems. And this will significantly reduce time, efforts, and cost of ship energy systems design. So current, this is led by VTT. They currently have a platform that uh, simulates the uh, ship energy flows within the ship. And the key here is to see what, what is the design, to automatically find the design space within uh, this uh, ship energy uh, flow uh, simulations in order to achieve better performances. The third uh, pilot use case is uh, very uh, interesting. 
and it, it is about autonomous ships in short sea transport. It's been led by Masterly, Konsberg, and Sindef Digital and Sindef Ocean. Uh, usually in current uh, uh, research, most of the, when it comes to autonomous shipping, most of the models focus on the situational awareness of the ship. For instance, uh, object detection or collision avoidance. Within this uh, pilot, um, we, the focus is on supporting the shore control centers that are monitoring and managing these, uh, the, uh, these autonomous ships. And the use case in, on the Oslo Fjord between uh, two ports, Horten and Moss, and uh, on a newly uh, uh, developed and soon to be deployed uh, shore control center. And the uh, use case here is the route planning for the unmanned vessels before until the sailing starts to make uh, predictions for the nearby vessels, to detect anomalies for nearby uh, vessels that may affect the planned route and the departure time of the unmanned vessels. Uh, and the second use case has to do after the unmanned vessel has already uh, sailed, during the sale of the, uh, of the unmanned vessels, to have route predictions and de uh, detection of anomalies for nearby vessels. The fourth pilot is uh, based on the um, NAPAS uh, Flint Intelligence software and focuses on having uh, route predictions and route optimization uh, decisions utilizing novel AI uh, models and taking into consideration dynamic information, weather, speed, uh, cost, fuel consumption, and traffic. And the second use case is about uh, modeling the port congestion. All the, uh, the models that come, uh, the uh, selected set of the models that will come from the pilots as well as the, the use cases and the experience we have done will be shared in AI for You platform, which will be uh, the one stop shop. Uh, for anyone looking for AI resources and technology uh, services and experts. And um, I think the, the most important key, as I said before, is not to provide a simple solution, but also to understand what are the aspects that you need to take into account when you're uh, investigating uh, and you're creating AI models. So we will be very happy to collaborate with you to tell us your case, to, we can, to uh, discuss about uh, a specific case that you want to do or experiment with. And please follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and uh, on our website. Thank you. Thank you, Spiros, for the presentation. Now is the, the turn for the questions and answers. So if there is uh, any, any question in local or, or remote, I cannot see the I cannot see the audience in the in Athens. Carlos, this is Christos. There's no question uh, from the local audience. So, okay. uh, if okay. you would like to wrap up uh, before we go to the break, to the lunch break. Oh, okay, perfect. I know that we are a little little behind the schedule as as always. That we no start worries. talking Very about this, uh, these nice presentations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, about these nice things. I. What I see is that, uh, you know, uh, wrapping up what we have been, what have been presented, I see a, a, a central point in the, in the, around the presentation that is data ports as a way or mechanism to exchange the data that are coming from different, different. For example, we have seen what has been presented in Mobi Data Lab, which uh, if we are able to be able to interoperate these data that are coming from, from, from different environments and link it. Uh, using the, the, the industrial data spaces as we are working in, in, in data ports together with that, bringing data coming from Bessel AI, from the, different, from the different ships that can be moving, and also uh, coming data from, uh, from also using the, the information coming from Vital 5G and also from the Sirene project. I think data ports can become a central point of everything. So, uh, I, I, I don't have any specific question, but I, I, I think that for the, uh, it's important that standardization and interoperability, the thing that we are bringing in data ports, is key to become a, a central point about everything. So, uh, Christos, this is my, my main thought 
coming from from this wonderful this wonderful panel. If you want to add uh, anything as, let's say, general chairman or organizer of everything. The, uh, Carlos, uh, as a matter of fact, the technology is here. The solutions were just presented. Let's see the, the outcomes in the near future. Collaboration, not only among the, the, the projects, the EU-funded projects, but also collaborations with industry partners, um, the policy makers, the port authorities, and uh, the, f the future is, uh, is very close. Thank you. Thank you very much, all. Thank you.